Thank you very much indeed for allowing me to come and speak here today. It's a great privilege and an honour honor to be here. And uh, I feel, somebody said to me before the summer school, oh, you're preaching on Genesis. That's Coles to Newcastle in Sydney. And I feel very much we're bringing Coles to Newcastle uh, in that I think we are looking at something which your forefathers, that we learned from your forefathers um, and your fathers, the younger ones, in England, and um, we owe a huge amount to the Sydney evangelicals who came across and taught us. Uh, but it is possible, isn't it, for us to drift away from what our fathers and forefathers taught us. And so I thought to come back to Acts 20 and have a look at the kind of ministry that builds the church would be very good for us. Two talks then. The first, the ministry that builds the church, and the second, training disciples for Bible ministry. And I want us to examine Paul, Paul's ministry as Luke describes it in Acts chapter 20. And here's one of the reasons why. Against the backdrop of what is a wonderful and deeply encouraging global movement in church planting, which all of us have been engaged in, you for longer than us in England, but now for 10, 15 years or so, I want to make a very simple observation that the language of church planting is not really a Bible metaphor. I know you know that. And it is, of course, nothing wrong with using non-Bible language to describe what you're doing. But sometimes we can drift along doing that without quite realizing that we've slightly redefined what we think we're about. And therefore, to come back to the Bible and have a look at the kind of ministry that builds a church, church building, after all, is the metaphor that is appropriate biblically, and to have a look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul was certainly very good for us at St. Helens after 10 to 15 years of church planting, and I hope it might serve us here today. What kind of ministry is it that builds the church? Acts 20 is, of course, towards the start of the sixth and final section of Acts. The sixth and final section of Acts begins at the marker in chapter 19, verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. And my understanding is that the apostle, the, that's rather Dr. Luke, has ordered his material carefully, that's what he tells us he's done, into what you might call panels in the book of Acts, each with a particular purpose, and he is wanting to teach us something in this final panel that begins in chapter 19, verse 20 and 21. You will know that much of Acts uh, 21 through to the end is devoted to Paul's public defence of his ministry, first of all in Jerusalem and uh, then in Caesarea uh, before, first of all, the tribune and, and then the... the, the, the uh, uh, consul and then the king himself. And a lot of people, I think, have tended to uh, group Acts 19 and 20 from verse uh, 21 back in with the ministry to Athens and Corinth and say, oh, well, here are just three, three ministries in three big cities, even though they argue in some of the best commentaries that there are these panel markers. And I want to suggest to you that perhaps Luke is running according to his panel markers that uh, Luke chapter, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 19, verse 20 is the final marker. And we now have, before we get to the public defense of his ministry in front of kings and so forth, we have what you might call, I think, a defense affidavit. This is what his ministry actually looked like. This is what caused the riot, the end of chapter 19. But this is what Paul's ministry actually was, Theophilus or emperor. And therefore what Luke has done uh, is quite wonderful, is he's given us, if you like, some sort of plumb line against which we can measure our own ministry. And in the goodness of God, as we look at this chapter, and we look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul and say, well, this is what built such a church in Ephesus that reached the entire surrounding area, how does ours measure, measure up to that? So my aim is to hold up a plumb line as we go to the Word of God and to ask, what was it that caused Paul to leave behind viable, thriving, energetic, self-replicating churches across the whole region? And 
along with Luke, my aim is that we should have confidence in such ministry and be certain about such ministry at the start of a year. I can't think why you start your year in January. We, we start ours in September, but there we are. Sort of things happen, don't they? I want to give you three basic headings. The first is this. Paul is no one-stop wonder. There will be three subheadings. Paul is no cowboy builder. He built the church. And Paul was no glamour boy glory hunter. He built the church. No one-stop wonder. Let's have a look at his travel itinerary, his travel companions, and his stopover travel timetable. His travel itinerary. A couple of years back, I was preaching through the whole of Acts, and as we got to chapter 20, verse 2, I suddenly noticed for the first time a familiar pattern. Just glance at it. When he'd gone through these regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months. When a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And as I paused and considered this, this word of encouragement, that actually Paul was traveling through the area strengthening and encouraging the churches, it occurred to me that this has been a major theme of Paul's ministry right the way from Acts chapter 11. Encouragement and the strengthening of the churches is the name of the game in much of Paul's travel work. Now this is so important, I want to spend what may seem to you inordinately long on it, just so that we get it from the text. So in chapter 11, if you look to the beginning of the church in Syrian Antioch, when the Jerusalem church heard that people were being converted in Antioch, what did they do? They sent Barnabas, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And Barnabas, chapter 11, verse 23, exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. He then went off to Tarsus and found Saul. You can imagine him sort of making his way around the souks trying to, 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 to find this man, Saul, and brought him into Antioch. And the two of them spent a, a year there teaching and instructing the disciples. And if you then flick forward to chapter 13 and verse 1, within no time we find a team of five teachers and preachers established in the church in Antioch. It's a multi-ethnic, multicultural team. And you have in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Barnabas, Simeon, who was a black guy from, I take it, therefore called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, a Roman, Menane, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, the posh guy, and Saul. They then send out, everybody says they send their best man. No, they send the apostle to the Gentiles. It may well have been that Manane was a far better man than Saul. We just don't know. Nobody tells us. But they send Saul and Barnabas off on the first missionary journey. They plant their churches. I think there are some maps to remind us of these things. They plant their journey. And by the end of chapter 14, verse 21, they've planted churches or strengthened churches in Cyprus, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Now, this is fascinating at the end of their first journey. There they are in Derby. Paul has just been chucked out of Lystria and stoned and left for dead. And they want to make their way back to Syrian Antioch. The journey back to Syrian Antioch, I did this, you know, geography degree is very useful on these things. You don't just colour in. Got the piece of paper, measured it, you know. Saul made the journey through the mountains on a number of occasions on his second and third journey. But this time, having just been left for dead in, 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 uh, 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 there in Lystra, wanting to get back to Syrian Antioch, he retraces his steps. And what does he do as he retraces steps? He goes back into Lystra, where he's stoned and le left for dead. And his aim in chapter 14, verse 22, is to strengthen the souls of the disciples, to encourage them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. The second missionary journey begins in chapter 15. Incidentally, at the end of chapter 15, after the Jerusalem Council, the church in Jerusalem again sends teachers up to Antioch to strengthen the disciples. That's what Judas and Silas do. And we find Paul and Barnabas remaining at, in Antioch for a considerable time, preaching and teaching the word of the Lord with many others. Chapter 15, verse 35. And then the second missionary journey begins and we find 
Paul saying to Barnabas, let's return and visit and see how they are in the churches that we planted, 1536. And so 1541, they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. At the end of the second missionary journey in chapter 18, verse 22, it's now around about 50 to 53 AD, they have planted churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, and Ephesus. He returns to Syrian Antioch. But before the start of the third missionary journey in chapter 18, verse 23, what do we find Paul doing? Verse 23 after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the whole the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, in chapter 19, verse 21, at the start, at the final and sixth panel, Luke tells us that Paul is determined to get to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost, and he's in a big hurry. But rather than going straight from Ephesus down to Antioch and then down to Jerusalem... Instead, he heads north, and he heads up north all the way through Troas and up through Macedonia and uh, uh, visits Philippi and so forth, and eventually he ends up down in Corinth, having been back and visited, or rather revisited, all of the churches again in order to encourage and strengthen them. And then, in our verse, chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, with a bit of opposition from the Jews... He decides not to set sail the direction he was going in or anywhere else, but rather to head to Jerusalem where he wants to get in a hurry by traveling land north up through Macedonia again and then setting sail. And by the way, he can't resist pitching on in at the beach at Miletus. Now, I, I, I'm sorry, I know you're highly intelligent and I'm sorry to go so slowly through this, but I wanted you to get the point. I was taught religious education and classics, that's how old I am, by an individual who he rather unfairly named Dippy Simpson. Uh, Dippy was interminably dull. He was a very decent man, but his voice went up and down like that, and so we called him Dippy Simpson. And he taught us, and we had to remember the maps of the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. That's what you did in RE in those days. And you also dissected the Gospels and demonstrated why they weren't written by... Anyway, we won't go into that. But Dippy never asked us the purpose of the journeys. Nor would I suggest do the maps themselves convey at least 50% of Paul's aim in those journeys. And therefore, I have tended to see the Apostle Paul as, oh, the great evangelist and church planter. Actually, he planted the word of God. <laughs> he built the church. And let's not overemphasize, yes, of course, he was the missionary to the Gentiles, and so we mustn't forget that. And I've tended to see the Apostle Paul as the man who selected key city centers, breezed into the CBD, planted a church, and then breezed on again even though he didn't actually always do that. I remember travelling with John Chapman up to St Helens one evening. We were talking about uh, some, some movement or other and city centres and all the rest. And he said, the trouble is, the text just doesn't say that. <laughs> he didn't necessarily always pick the key city centres. In fact, when he goes to Lystra, he worked in the entire surrounding region, if you look carefully at the text. So all you great strategists, I'm afraid... Sorry. Strategists like myself have to pay more careful attention to the Bible. What then was Paul's goal? Well, if you read the corresponding epistles, 1 Timothy 3, for example, and Ephesians, you see Paul's theology of the church. It is a pillar and buttress of the truth, assembly of the living God. It is the place in which the mystery of God is being declared to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. O oh, precious church of Christ! And so Paul's intention, as well as planting the seed of God's word, as the word of God drew together assemblies of God's people, was to strengthen those assemblies so that they were healthy and became themselves centres, like Antioch, like Ephesus, like he wanted for Rome and, and Corinth, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15. Indeed, may I suggest this sort of mildly tongue-in-cheek? 
were Dr. Luke to have written an extra chapter Acts, say Acts 29, might it not be that at least 50% of the chapter would have been devoted not so much to planting churches as to building the church? And if you say to yourself, I'm the pioneer church planter. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a slight caricature. You may say, oh, I'm the pioneer church planter. But <laughs> do you see what I mean? If you say to yourself, I'm the pioneer church planter, and you haven't understood that church planting, the word you're using, is actually not a biblical metaphor. The biblical metaphor is building the church, and you're not building the church, then there will be all sorts of problems that follow. I would suggest at least 50%, probably 70%, if you look at the time scale of Paul's work, over decades, is spent strengthening and encouraging the church. Not to the detriment of evangelism. Please don't misunderstand me. This is not a kind of closed, inward-looking, you know, the Lord will bring them through the roof because that's what he did in Mark 2. Now, it seems to me this need to be, needs to be reflected in our preaching, in our energy and time, in our priorities and concerns and prayers, and in what we consider ourselves to be doing on church leadership teams, which is what I think we have here today. He is no one-stop wonder. Look at his travel itinerary. Look at his travel companions. Verses 4 and 5. We have a girl on our ministry training scheme at the moment from, from, from Greece. And she, when she stands up to read the Bible in church, pronounces the names as a Greek person would. Forgive me if uh, you think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. Isn't it, is, it is interesting? So you'll read a number of people writing on this, and they will say they were administering the collection. Is that Timothy, really? Look at Timothy's ministry in the pastoral epistles. Is that Aristarchus? So when I was preparing, I chased through all these names and saw how they were described in the rest of the New Testament. Aristarchus is a faithful worker. He was uh, on Paul's, if you like, word ministry team. Beloved brother and fellow faithful fellow minister. And so I don't think it's at all, if you look at there, two from one city, two from another church, two from another church, I don't think it's all overreaching Luke's purpose in recording this, given that he's wanting to present, if you like, this defense affidavit for Theophilus, to suggest that these are his, <laughs> you'll think I'm overreaching here, I'm sure, but these are sort of his ministry trainees being schooled in ministry and appropriately deployed in ministry and being used both to pioneer and consolidate ministry. You look at the way they're used, that's how they're used, these individuals. Ties exactly in with Paul's stated strategy in 2 Timothy 2.2, all in the province of Asia have deserted me, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Is this not what Paul is doing as he travels with this band of men sent by the local churches with him as part of the missionary band, yes, handling the collection, but also being deployed and coming back and being deployed rather like the 72 in Luke 10. His travel itinerary, his travel companions... Paul is no one-stop wonder. Just look, I mean, a number of you smiled when we got to chapter, verses 7 through to verse 12, his stopover agenda. On his travels, what did the apostle do? Was it tea and biscuits with the diocesan clergy? Was it drinks at the presbytery or the vestry meeting? No, chapter 7, verse 12, we're given his stopover agenda. We're given evidence that he is an authentic apostle of the living Lord Jesus in this new age of the kingdom of Christ. But we are also seen what he actually did when he visited. And so on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. He prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Don't be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed, and they took the youth away. So he labored through the night, dialoguing, speaking, enjoying fellowship, and encouraging the brothers. Now, it seems to me immensely helpful 
that Dr. Luke starts this final section of Acts with a summary of Paul's activities like this. Remember, Luke is our theologian. He is our teacher. And he, our instructor and theologian, has lined up his theology for a pastoral purpose. And our responsibility is not to load our theology or find our so-called theology in what Luke said, but it is actually to allow the way Luke has lined up his theology, in other words, to hold up a plumb line of authentic ministry, to then shape the way we think about ministry. And his aim is that we might have certainty well, now, when we've been working on this for a while at St. Helens, um, I got, we, we meet as a, a whole staff team uh, with all, uh, sort of all the associated ministry once a month. You know, we meet every week for half an hour, and then we have a much longer meeting. And so I brought this to the, uh, the assembled staff team, and we, I got this far, and I said to them, now, would you all please break into groups, and you tell me what you think the application is for St. Helens? That's the way to preach, isn't it? No, no that, that's, that, that's lazy. That's lazy. Yes, it is lazy. Let me tell you what the St. Helens staff team said. Because we'd be very similar. We'd all be thinking of working in the same kind of ways as you guys. Here's some of their applications. One, keep teaching till someone dies. <laughs> that was not a right application. Two. Paul was not a lone maverick church planter. The work of gospel ministry is slow, messy, and long-term. There is absolutely no sense of a quick fix here. There is extraordinary long-term care for the health of the local church. Somebody said, uh, you know, you're the, the, you know you're, you, you're the, I feel I'm here in this great college and you're the ones who will be able to tell me whether this is right or not, but somebody said we must not play off the church planter and the trainer as if they're two different things. You know sometimes people do all these kind of tests on potential church planters to see if they carry a chainsaw in their luggage and that sort of stuff. Do you know what I mean? You know, are they this kind of person? I wonder if their first question is, is this person a person who believes in the building of the church through long-term, consistent, steady, serious teaching of the word of God? I've seen people, I mean, we've, in God's goodness, I don't know, I, I never keep track of how many churches have been planted from St. Helens. It's somewhere between 20 and 30. And if you look at the people who've actually been involved, there are any number of different people, and the Lord has brought around them, as they've taught the Word of God, the necessary gifts to make it work. But the number one criteria is this. Are they men of the Word and prayer, committed to teaching the Word of God in the local church, strengthening and building it? And if that's you, then praise God for you. The way it changed my own practice at St. Helens was we had tended to say, well, we're going to start churches, cut the umbilical cord, and leave them to it. And I thought, William, this isn't quite responsible. And we ought to at least have some sort of more developed mentoring and so forth. And then the understanding of ministry in the local church is a long-term work in teaching the word. Here's another thing somebody said, you know, in the 1990s, with evangelism every Sunday, which is a great thing, we're always wanting to bear the newcomer in mind, coupled with the seeker-sensitive model of ministry, there is a danger that we had aimed always for the lowest common denominator, with the result that the church planter becomes the only mature Christian in church. <laughs> because if your teaching is always aimed at the lowest common denominator, I don't mean it should be a serious, boring lecture. But if your teaching is always just aimed at the newcomer with nothing to stretch anybody else, you will become the only evangelist. And you'll die young, as we'll see later. <laughs> and then training the team and trainees. It does seem to me, and you may think I'm overstretching this, so I'd be interested to know what you think. It does seem to me that the apostle had his eye on key co-workers. That's what he tells us he did in 2 Timothy 2.2. Travelled with a band... And it does seem that the cities were prepared, or the churches in Berea and elsewhere, were prepared to let these guys go with Paul. Let's now move on to our second point and his meeting on the beach. 
Paul is no cowboy builder. I, I feel this is a little unfair on cowboys. If you are a cowboy, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> cowboy builders are people who breeze in, put up something that's pretty ramshackle, and then drift off and it falls down. So Paul comes to Miletus. He can't resist stopping off, sends to Ephesus, and calls the elders of the church to come to him. You yourselves know how I lived among you. Paul, of course, was in Ephesus for three years, or up to three years, and Luke's record, therefore, of his ministry there is of immense significance because this is settled gospel ministry, if you see what I mean. Notice the obvious point that we'll have pointed out numerous times. They come, they are elders, they are described as overseers, they are bishops in the local church, and there are many of them. Notice, however, that it is a word ministry, that it is a thorough word ministry, that it's a faithful word ministry, that it's an accountable word ministry, and that it is a word ministry that will always be under threat. It's a word ministry. This comes again and again and again, doesn't it? Have a look at verse, verse 20. I did not shrink from declaring to you everything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house testifying both to Jews and Greeks. Look at verse 24, halfway through. Um, that I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And verse 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. What then was the key to establishing successful church growth in pre-Christian Europe and in Asia? First, in-depth, long-term encouragement and strengthening of churches through the teaching of the Word of God. And what that means for effective church growth in a static church setting is declaration, instruction, proclamation, and testimony. I would love to have this truth drummed into, I know it is absolutely core here, but into every church leader, every trainee, every theological college lecturer and, and, and principal, every member of every local church, that the key to establishing secure churches that are, if you like, self-replicating in their ministry, that have an impact on the whole region, that become Antiochs and Ephesuses and Romes and Sydneys and so forth, is this ministry of the teaching of the word. Oh, that's typical of you evangelicals, particularly the old-fashioned ones like you. You're so narrow. There's so much more, and it's particularly typical of St. Helens. But if you want to research this, glance back through Thessalon the, the ministry in Thessalonica in chapter 17. What did he do in chapter 17, verses 2 and 3? He reasoned from the scriptures. He explained and proved that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. And he proclaimed to them Christ. What did he do in Berea? Well, the Jews were not more noble. They received the word with all eagerness and they examined the scriptures daily with him as he proclaimed the word. What did he do in Athens? Actually, what he did in Athens was to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. He did that publicly to everybody, and we assume, therefore, he gave a sermon very much in line with Acts 13. As a result of his proclamation, people had questions, and he went and answered the follow-up questions at the Areopagus. <laughs> but the questions were stemming from, first and foremost, a public, clear proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus. It's worth putting that in our thinking as we consider contextualization and all those sort of things. Similarly in Corinth and in Ephesus. So it is the ministry of the word. And what is required, you know, I was back in England, I was back in an area where there has been near total wipeout of gospel ministry. This is true for much of Australia. Having been to Perth and Brisbane and Canberra and Melbourne, and I don't really remember where else, but other places in Australia, this is true of much of Australia. And I hope large numbers of you are thinking, we're going to go. I mean, Perth is no distance away. I know you think it's the back of beyond, <laughs> but it's only five hours. And the next alternative is New Zealand. So I should think about Perth. No, sorry, that's cheap. 
<laughs> I've just been in New Zealand. I know where I'm speaking now, and New Zealand was wonderful. So, but the near total wipeout, what is going to be the key to re-establishing gospel ministry in these places? Well, you've seen it, haven't you, with the work of Paul Harrington in Trinity, or the work at St. Matthew's that uh, Kanishka and Kayleigh were so involved in. Long-term, steady, serious teaching of the Word of God. Now, I know you know this, but isn't it encouraging at the beginning of a year to come back to the Word of God, hold up the plumb line and say, do you know, what they taught us in college and what our grandparents were doing, that's authentic. It's the real McCoy. It's thorough. Notice the breadth, the depth, the specifics and the scope. So, verses 20 and 21. We're still in Acts 20, and we're now looking at verses 20 and 21. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So his eyes were on the corporate. He taught in public. His eyes were on the individual. He taught from house to house. His eyes were on the specific. He taught the Jews in the synagogue. And his eyes were on the general. He taught the Greeks. Now, we could run a whole um, college uh, module just on these points. We could picture Paul, couldn't we, at his staff meeting with his ministry trainees, Sopater, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Timothy, Tychicus, and Trophimus. How is such and such a family doing? And is there a people group in our town that we ha- or in our neighbourhood that we aren't actually yet impacting? And what about the public meeting tomorrow? We all set for it in the lecture hall of Tyrannus and so forth. And we've been to the synagogue, but what about? It's a word ministry. It's a thorough word ministry. It's faithful. So Paul was no innovator, and he summarizes his work in verse 27, where he says... Therefore I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I wonder what you think that means. I I do wonder what you think that means. I'd be fascinated to know. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Personally, I don't think that... uh, Paul taught from Genesis through Revelation, and that's quite an easy one to work out because quite a lot of the New Testament hadn't been written. (laughs) Do you remember Mark Dever? What a great guy. I'm sure Mark's been here many times. What a terrific friend in gospel. And it's lovely to find people in other places where you think, well, we're doing so so many things. We're doing the same thing, and it's thrilling. But uh, Mark, when he arrived at Capitol Hill, taught every Sunday a whole book of the Bible. And I don't think he taught all the way through the night till somebody fell out of the window. He just gave a summary, 66 books of the Bible, his first 66 weeks at Capitol Hill. But he does tell us three times in slightly different ways what he did teach. Did you notice in verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting that in all of Luke's writing, Repentance is fundamental to the preaching of the gospel. It was so good to hear Peter Jensen talking about this earlier, that if you preach a gospel of re- uh, without repentance, it is not the gospel. Isn't it interesting? Did you notice in, in uh, Luke 3, I think it is, where John the Baptist's ministry is described, he taught people concerning repentance and forgiveness of sins. How is his ministry summarised? Thus... He preached the gospel. It's very interesting, isn't it? That John the Baptist's ministry is described in, by Luke as he teaches repentance and forgiveness of sins, as preaching the gospel. And you'll find that time and time again. I mean, Luke 15, the lost uh, coin, the lost sheep, and the, it, you know, it's repentance uh, it, it, that produces the, 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 the rejoicing in heaven as a lost sinner is found. So repentance and faith. Verse 24, what did he do? He taught what he received from the Lord Jesus and testified the gospel of the grace of God. 
and then 25, he went about, this is fascinating, isn't it? Because I know what some New Testament scholars say about Paul. He went about proclaiming the kingdom. And given that the idea of kingdom, of the kingdom of God, is such a uniting theme in the whole of the Bible, and given the idea that the grace of God lies at the very heart of the kingdom of God, we find that in the Abrahamic material, and given that King Jesus summons us to repentance and faith, this can be described as the whole counsel of God. Look at Acts 13, that model sermon of the Apostle Paul, and you will see him doing exactly that. So then, this was not tabloid Christianity, a few sound bites here and there. It was not Jesus' light. It was certainly not belonging before believing. He called for repentance. Nor was it seeker services or pre-evangelism. It was serious instruction in the whole counsel of God. And therefore, he saw himself as innocent of the blood of all men. It's a word ministry. It's a thorough word ministry. It's a faithful word ministry. May I put it like this? I, I don't know how you, you'll, uh, whether you'll get a better heading this, than this, but it's an accountable word ministry, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Notice this, that the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. And we often say this uh, at the beginning of the year to our staff team. How are you feeling at the beginning of the year as you think about what stands ahead of you? And some of you will be feeling, oh, well, I'm absolutely terrified. And I say, well, I'm so thrilled because people who think, oh, well, I'm God's gifters and Helens are a total pain in the neck. And if that's what you're thinking, I hope well, God will very quickly make you feel, oh, I'm really terrified. Okay, so then we start with encouraging words like that. <laughs> but, but notice, of whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Now, again, this fascinates me because back in chapter 14, Saul and Barnabas appointed them. <laughs> and yet here he can describe them as being made overseers by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a little insight into Paul's understanding of uh, human action and the work of God. But here you are on your staff team thinking about the year ahead. God has made you, by his Holy Spirit, overseer. He's given you this charge. Sitting next to Dick uh, at the beginning of the year, I was just speaking, Dick Lucas, I was just speaking on 1 Timothy, starting to speak, he, he, I said, oh, well, what are, your, what, what are your thoughts on, on 1 Timothy? You know, there's a furious of my notebook out, taking everything down. And he just said a couple of things, and then he said, William, God has given you this charge. It's very sobering, isn't it? And it's the Holy Spirit who's done it. You're not alone. It's God's plan for you to be doing what you're doing wherever you find yourself. Notice that in verse 28 there, pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock, <laughs> every single one of them. I remember John Stott speaking on this once in England and saying, yes, that means all the flock. <laughs> Notice that it's the church of God. It's not your church. Isn't it ugly when people talk about my church? my wardens, my PCC. I always find that a very ugly thing. It's the church you serve. It's his church. Notice that you're to pay careful attention to yourselves. And I think in the New Testament, I notice that there's both a corporate element to this and a personal. And at the end of the day, you will stand before the Lord Jesus alone. And your accountability group won't be around you. And therefore, you are accountable to him. So pay careful attention to yourself. I've noticed that actually people can pull the wool over their own wives for two years. They're not going to find it hard pulling the wool over their accountability group. And they need to know that they are going to stand before the Lord Jesus alone on the last day. And notice that he obtained it with his own blood. Oh, precious, 
church of Christ. It's worth just casting your mind to wherever you're going to be next Sunday or where you were yesterday. (laughs) And however kind of impressive it might seem and however feeble it might seem, this is the assembly of the living God. It's the house of God. And he obtained it with his own blood. And then, as Peter was reminding us um, at the start of this meeting, it is a ministry that is always under threat and that we are to safeguard. Look at verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Again, isn't that an interesting way of putting it? Actually, what these insurgents are doing in our mainline denominations is utterly self-seeking as they seek to draw away disciples after themselves. They'll dress it up in all sorts of wonderful clothing, but they are actually seeking to boost their own ego. And therefore... We need to be alert and to remember that part of Paul's ministry, day and night, was to admonish everyone with tears. Now, here are some of the applications from the St. Helens staff team. Everybody's always looking for a silver bullet. There's no such thing other than the word of God. This is what established the church in Ephesus, God's word at work. Here's something somebody else said. So many people focus on what the word produces rather than the word itself. Isn't that an interesting observation, that we focus on the fruit rather than the root? I'll say a bit more about this in the second talk, but particularly as a movement grows, I have noticed, the next generation will see the inadequacy in any number of areas of the fruit, and then they will set up movements and things to focus on the fruit of word ministry, whether it is community or church growth or Christian experience. Say, well, this person's ministry, there wasn't much experience or there wasn't much community, so we're going to set up a whole movement devoted around community. But that's to focus on the fruit rather than the root. If you focus on the teaching of the word of God, the fruit will flow. Somebody else uh, pointed us to the breadth, the depth, the scope, and the specifics of Paul's ministry and the danger of being so focused every single week on the outsider that we're not doing that and then asked somebody else to think about our trainees. And then finally, I'm just going to touch on this, read the relevant passages. Paul was no glamour boy, glory hunter. He was not, if you might put it like this, a celebrity preacher. Look at verses 18 and 19. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Have a look at verse 22. Now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonments and afflictions Await me, but I don't account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that, the, that I receive from the Lord Jesus. Have a look at verse 31. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I didn't cease night or day. And then verse 33. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities And to those who were with me, in all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul was not seeking human glory. And in the defense affidavit, he wants, Luke wants Theophilus to know and to be certain the shape of authentic gospel ministry. And isn't verse 32 quite Glorious, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build and to give 
the inheritance amongst those who are sanctified. It's actually the word of God that will do it. And if only we will concentrate on the root, the thing that actually drives it, the word of God, then the fruit will flow. There is public teaching and teaching from house to house. What does that look like in our particular setting? I'll say it now. I'll touch on it in the next talk. When I look at the New Testament uh, and the ministry of the word, it seems to me that the ministry of the word manifests itself in all sorts of different ways. In our more high reformed brethren's theologies, they tend to develop something called a theology of preaching, which refers only to the pulpit. Now, don't get me wrong, I have a very, very high view of what happens as we gather the assembled people of God together and teach the word of God. I think God is at work. And by his spirit, he is applying his truth to any number of different settings and situations. I think it is hugely powerful. But I happen to think that the word of God is equally powerful when you are teaching it in a small group and one-to-one. And I wonder whether our training reflects that. So if house-to-house is a smaller assembly of people, and I imagine it was, it may have been whole churches... But in public and from house to house, maybe churches meeting in, uh, in you know, Priscilla and Aquila's home, actually. But it may equally have been him going and visiting, <laughs> teaching the word of God here and teaching. And in Acts, we also see uh, Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. It seems to me we're much better. I was helped by this by a friend of mine in this building, actually, to see it. That much better to develop a theology of the word of God in its various manifestations than a theology of the preacher, once you develop a theology of the preacher, and I know I'm pushing things, the danger is you end up back in almost a Roman Catholic view of your church leaders. And one of the things I do, sorry, I will wrap it on for a while, but one of the things I do with our apprentices when we're teaching them preaching is I take them um, to the, I think it's a Norwegian, I've just forgotten, to the Norwegian Reformed Church in St. Austin Friars. Austin Friars. It's a fascinating building. Because you've got these great steps coming up, and then you've got this massive pulpit, and then at the bottom you've got this huge table. Now that is, you know, we always eventually put our theology into our buildings. Here we have the theology of the preacher. And my observation is that as that develops increasingly in a congregation, and people then develop the kind of, oh, about the pulpit. Do you, do you understand? I mean, I don't know if that transfers. But, oh, you know, you talk to anybody who's heard and had this theology reinforced in the structures and models of the church, not training leaders, not expecting your leaders to give four or five hours preparation before they teach the Bible in their small groups, not taking one-to-one ministry really seriously, a theology of the Word of God that is powerful. It seems to me, if you develop this high reformed view that the, the glory of God is, I, I, I'm, what does the Westminster Confession say? God is most glorified through the preaching of his word. Now, what happens is, I can't believe that the, the, the early reformers were thinking, oh, I think they were thinking, everybody's out there preaching the word of God in all these different settings. I don't know. Some of you historians will tell me. <laughs> anyway, there we are. <laughs> beware, I would say, beware the person who has this or is wanting to develop this high, high theology of preaching. It's certainly not in... Anyway, there we are. I think I've said it. Uh, just one, one other thing, because I've done a lot of work thinking about this. If you go to, uh, to Luke 9, 51, Jesus says to the disciples, his apostles, go literally before my face as messengers. Who goes before the face of Jesus as messengers in Luke's gospel? John the Baptist and Malachi and Elijah. So Jesus, the disciples having identified Jesus as the Holy One of God, they now have the apostolic word. He sends them like Elijah, like Malachi, like John the Baptist, which is why they say, shall we call fire down? Because that's exactly what Elijah does. But what does he do at the beginning of chapter 10? He takes 72 others, that is others like the ordinary disciple. They now have the powerful word of God, the authoritative word of God. And he sends them 
before his face as messengers. Which surely in Acts 2 is why when Peter says, what is being fulfilled here is what Joel spoke about, your young men are seeing visions. What he's saying is, everybody now is not a prophet as in initiating the word of God, but they've got the apostolic word, so everybody's out doing it. The powerful word of God. Once you start to institutionalize your preaching thing and so forth, then you stop the growth of the gospel ultimately. So, sorry about that, that extra talk. Good. And, and, yep, there's a hand back there. Is there a place for strategy? How marvellous. Yes. <laughs> and shall I tell you what the strategy is? Teach the Bible. <laughs> now, okay, and say your prayers. So um, the second talk is going to think about this a bit more, and I'd love you to think about this. You know, th we'll think about this together. But it seems to me that some church leaders think they are the strategist. Um, I'm not sure that fits with m my understanding of the body of Christ. Um, your job, if you're a Bible teaching church leader, is to teach the Bible. That is, the, and everybody asks me, you know, Selena is full of business people, what's the strategy this year? And for the first 15 years, I found different ways of saying basically the same thing. And then in the 15th year at our annual meeting, I confessed that I'd been spending 15 years saying the same thing. And I reckon, I'm now 55, I may have another 12 years, and I can get away with another 12 years basically just saying the same thing, <laughs> that we teach the Bible. Now, that does not mean that you don't pay careful attention to the matters you're talking about, which are minor things, like where we meet and whether we plant a church and so forth. These minor, as uh, uh, Philip Jensen calls them, tactics, need to be considered. But are you the person to do it? The beauty, I think, of Anglican polity, if I may say so for a moment, is that it encourages us to lead by teaching the word of God and then amongst those around us, allowing the word of God to use those gifts amongst the wardens, church council and key leaders to develop what you are calling a strategy. So the way I would do something like this, how, how did we get St. Helens into a church planting church in 2001, 2002? We talked about the need for the multiplication of work centers where the word of God is preached. And over the course of the year, we kept talking about that in all sorts of different settings. And we would say, now, how do you think we should do it? And it seems to me that that is allowing the word of God to penetrate. And there are people, if I may say, in your church who are much better at thinking about these things than you. I'm sorry, I don't know you. That may not be true. But generally speaking, around this room, it is true. It is true. Yeah, okay, please don't think that you're the great strategist. So I know, you know, church leaders spend hours sitting there, so they're developing strategies and all the rest of it. And then they go out and present them to the church. And the church are thinking, what planet is he on? Or they hear of some great movement that has developed these models of ministry out there, and they say, we're going to import this to our church. If I was working in my parents' church down in Cornwall, I would teach the word of God until such point as some people were converted. And then I would say, look, God commands us to tell others about the Lord Jesus. How do you think we should do it here? I would ask Thomas um, if he got converted. That would be a miracle. <laughs> but if he were to be converted, he'd know amongst the farming community. Uncle Fred, if you ask Uncle Fred anything... He won't give you an answer. Actually, he's dead now, so he won't give you an answer. But uh, <laughs> he wouldn't give you an answer. He's not my uncle. You know, everybody called him Uncle Fred, Fred Martin. Anybody, if you wanted to know something, you'd ask Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred was a lovely Christian guy. And if I'd gone to work in that parish and I'd come from outside, and even if I'd come from inside, I would have always, if Uncle Fred was converted, say to him, now, look, we've been told we're, we're meant to be advancing gospel ministries. We're thinking of starting another ministry. Where do you think the most important place is? So I'd teach the word... And then let the strat what you call the strategy. I certainly wouldn't import things like that. Now, that doesn't mean you don't pay any attention to things going on outside. But I think that's one of the beauties of Anglican polity, that it actually encourages us to do that. You're not shackled by these wretched congregational votes all the time. Um, sorry, you maybe are. Maybe you are. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, now, there are many, many, many things wrong with Anglican polity, but you know, that's one of the strengths of them. 
how much theological education is good to have within the staff team? As much as you can get your hands on. Yeah, I think it is a terrific thing. I think um, we are taught to think through theological education, and we are, as it says, educated. My personal view is that you cannot learn ministry in theological education. Um, of course, you'll pick up all sorts of tips and so forth, but I used to put it rather crudely, please, please, please go to get college and get the very best theological ed education you get. Please, and do it residentially if you possibly can. Please do it. But realise what's going on. You're being taught to think, and you're being educated, and you're being given tools but you'll learn ministry in the local church. I uh, suggested that some ministries sprout up that focus on the fruit that comes from the word of God or should come from the word of God rather than the root of teaching the word. And does that helpfully alert us to some deficiencies in our practice of teaching the word? Is that your question? I think yes, absolutely. That can be very helpful. But I would never, ever, ever want to develop a whole ministry around it. And my fear is that in some circles, in order to, and this, this is looking at it from a very worldly point of view, that some, some you know, we're all, we've all, we've got, the flesh is here, isn't it? And particularly when there's a general view about the word of God, you know, the young Turk wants to make a name for themselves and want to flex their muscles. And, and so I think that can be a very, very dangerous area when you're in your 30s and you know, tw late 20s, 30s, that you're wanting to flex your muscles. Well, please flex your muscles in the word that produced the churches in the first place and the Christians. And you may see a deficiency. Well, keep the word front and centre. Please don't set up a whole nother movement to distract everybody. You'll be a nuisance. Yeah. And I, I think that has happened and we see it. We, because America has been so far ahead of us in all sorts of ways, you often see that very specialist ministries developing in the States. And they're very attractive to us because they come saying, uh, oh, well, here's one from England. We must work on community. And so we all get excited, here's the latest silver bullet, and we rush off, if I'm not mi mixing too many pictures at the moment, we rush off after community. But if you teach the word of God effectively and well in your local church, guess what's going to happen? God will produce community. Work is another one. Um, you know, we, we think, oh, well, not spending enough time on work, and so we've got to develop a whole theology of work. Look in the New Testament. There, there, there is very, very little, actually. If you, when I was in the army, if somebody had come in and told me, oh, I'm going to teach you how to be an army officer, I'd say, you know, absolutely. Have you ever, you know, and the answer is no. And you won't have a clue. Teach me the word of God. And do you know, I think the Holy Spirit might enable me to apply it to how to be a Christian army officer. And that's why I said at the beginning, we need in our city centres churches with a clear Bible teaching ministry that is not just topic, topic, topic to try and excite people, but that is establishing mature Christian men and women who will go into their workplace with a proper theology of work, that they are there first and foremost as Christians to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to their colleagues, secondly as a lawyer or a street sweeper or something like that. Um, so, so uh, that's what I'm. So I don't don't think I'm saying we shouldn't be corrected from time to time, of course. But for goodness sake, don't set up a centre for doing this, that, or the other. You'll just be a nuisance. So, with the lines that you've drawn in ministry, how do you relate this to women's ministry at your particular church? Well, I strongly suggest you go to my wife's seminar because she's going to talk all about this. And haven't you written a paper on this, uh, Pete? Or, <laughs> if I remember rightly, you've written something about it. I, but, but what a great question. It is a good question. This is a good question. I, I mean, Janet will say that um, we uh, will we'll tell you in the seminar, I'm sure, that, uh, that, that we try and make sure if a woman is married, that she's studying the Bible in, primarily with her husband in, in a small group. We do, however, have small groups for women who can't get out and so forth uh, in the evening or at home with their children. And yes, we want our women's workers to be thoroughly, thoroughly trained. I mean, I look at the women we have working for us and they are they're awesome. I mean, they are fantastic, 
And, and you look around the room here at the women in women's work who I know, and I think, wow, the Lord has raised up. And we have a very clear complementarian view of Bible teaching. And I'll tell you an extraordinary thing in England. Churches that have a, a complementarian view of Bible teaching have far, far more women teaching the Bible than those who don't. I, you know, I don't know how that works, but anyway, there it is. So, I mean, Janet, I don't want to steal Janet's thunder. Janet will talk a lot about that uh, later on.